Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 2nd, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, During the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what we believe is the overriding issue at both the state and federal levels during this year's election cycle. Second, is HB 331 what we call the oil credit bailout bill, defensible because it, quote, creates jobs, close quote. And third, do we need another federal corporate income tax cut in the near future? And now let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. That's right. Brad Keithley with Alaska's for Sustainable Budget is on the program with us every uh, Tuesday, and we get a chance to talk about his weekly top three, which he thinks are the top three most important issues facing Alaskans and Americans Brad Keithley joins us this morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great this morning. How are you? I am doing pretty darn good. I'm feeling feeling pretty good right now. So, uh, what uh, what 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 do you got here? You got some you got some top three things that we really need to be paying attention to, and uh, and I think that uh, where where would you like to start? Like I said, I'm a little scattered today. So, where would you like to start? Well, let's start with uh, uh, with what I think the overriding issue uh, is in this coming election cycle, both at the federal level and at the state level. Uh, we talked last week about some specific issues, but I think, to me, there's one overriding issue that uh, that I think is important uh, in this coming campaign, and and that issue is what do the candidates propose, both at the federal level and at the state level. Uh, uh, as a result of this election, if they're elected as a result of this election, to do about the looming fiscal crisis uh, that we've got at the federal level. Uh, we're already in it, but not many people are, are appreciating that. It's getting worse uh, uh, by the year. Uh, and, and, and frankly, the same thing's true at the state level. I know we've been in a fiscal situation for uh, the last uh, four or five years, but frankly, it's not going to get any better and it's going to get worse. Uh, and the question is, uh, the question that I would put to candidates, uh, if I had one question, is not about the specifics of the permanent fund dividend or not about the specifics of, of HB 331, though both of those are important. But the one question I would put to them is, for, what, do you, what are you going to do uh, uh, as uh, if you're elected uh, to improve the fiscal situation uh, for the next uh, four years out, uh, next five years out, next 10 years out. There's been some recent analysis. The reason this comes to a point for me is uh, the Congressional Budget Office published some analysis last week of the track uh, that the federal government is on. Right. And and it's, it's, it's not a good one. Uh, we have – we run through all of our major trust funds uh, by the early 2030s on the track we're on. The the deficit is uh, the annual deficit is expanding from roughly 650 million dollars uh, to well over a billion dollars annually. Uh, the total national debt goes from 20 uh, uh, trillion dollars, where it currently is, to, to over 30 trillion dollars uh, in the next 10 years. We're we're on a track uh, that that really wrecks the future 
for for future Americans, uh, wrecks the fiscal future for future Americans. And so the the question is not not how are you going to solve so much these these minor issues, relatively minor issues in the big scheme of things, but what are you gonna, what are you going to do to get the fiscal situation uh, back on track? And the same thing is true, frankly, at the state level. Uh, if you look, if you if you we've spent a lot of time the last uh, last couple of weeks sort of sort of ginned up by the by the CBO analysis we've spent a lot of time looking at the state uh, fiscal track and the same thing's true we think we got a bad situation now uh, but if you look going forward uh, at what's going on with uh, for example pers and ters reimbursements or pers right. and ters costs that the state is paying they're growing at eight percent a year uh, that actually may be uh, understating uh, their growth uh, 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 Pat Pitney, the director of OMB, uh, said that uh, last month. Uh, we may be we we may, we may not be capturing the full level of of PERS and TERS payments that we're that we're going to have to be making over the next next ten years. You look at Medicaid uh, and the costs that are expanding at the state at the federal level, uh, and that carries over to the uh, to the state level. Uh, the amount of healthcare costs that uh, that are being passed through. Uh, through med are being recovered through Medicaid. Uh, you look at just trying to hold K through 12 relatively constant against inflation. Once you add all those things up, we have we have the same sort of trajectory uh, going on in Alaska uh, as as you see at the federal level. And and yes, we do have some oil prospects uh, out there in Alaska. Thank goodness uh, that 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 we look forward to developing. But at the same time, you know we've sort of had a miracle the last few years of being able to hold Prudo uh, production steady, that's going to go into decline. Kaparik's going to continue in a decline. So we've got ex- major fields uh, in our in our existing inventory of fields that are going to go into decline from a from a revenue standpoint. So you've got you, you can see that same trajectory that people are talking about uh, at the federal level showing up in the state level. And the key question to me is to any candidate is looking forward. What are you going to do about that? What are your steps? To deal with not just the current fiscal crisis, but but the increasing fiscal crisis that's sitting out there in front of us. Well, and I think that's that's the big thing. I mean, it is this the the debt is what's going to kill us. Um, I think it was Einstein who said, you know, the only thing more powerful than the atomic bomb was compounding interest. And we start looking at this, and we and we see. You know, when we start talking about the fact that our debt service is going to be the single largest line item in the federal budget, uh, and we're not going into debt here in the state of Alaska yet, but if we continue down this track, we will. I mean, it's it's the same kind of behavior. This is monkey see, monkey do. And as you said, we have been talking about this, but it just seems like uh, even amongst people who are... Uh, semi-conservative. I was having a conversation the other day, and he's like, "Well, you know, we can't cut our way to prosperity." And I just looked at him and thought, uh, "Yeah, I know. I understand that you can't always cut your way to prosperity, but can't you find stuff that doesn't need to be done? I mean, can't you find things that are not that are nice to haves and not must haves? Couldn't we find? I mean, you've got a university system with three, a single system with three different administrative uh, arms or, or redundant three different administrative levels. I mean, there are millions of dollars in there that could be fixed, and yet nobody seems to be willing to make that hard call and say, "No, enough is enough." Yeah. Well, there's there's two things about the state level. In fact, we are going into debt. We've, we've characterized it as drawing down from the CBR reserve, the constitutional budget budget reserve. But under the Constitution, we have an obligation to pay that to pay that reserve back to, true, true. to give that same reserve forward uh, to future generations as as we've used it for ourselves. It's sort of I mean, that's the fiscal capacity to deal with crises uh, uh, that we've that we've created out there. And and we've drawn that down 2019, probably $14 billion, $15 billion. Uh, and that's an obligation that we have that we have to pay back. We've taken it down, we've taken it down to less than $2 billion or around $2 billion. And, and it's supposed to be up in the 15, 16, 17 uh, range. So we have an obligation. This generation has an obligation to pay that back. Nobody, nobody. Uh, has a plan right now on how they're going to do that. I mean, they're arguing about whether they can squeak us by 
uh, based on current revenues, but nobody has a plan to, to pay that back and build the, build the reserve back up. And when people talk about you can't cut your way to prosperity, okay, you can't cut spending, I accept that, then, then we're talking about taxes. We already have one tax, the PFD tax. We've cut right. that. We've, we have a 50, 50% tax on PFDs uh, that, we've, that we've cut in half. That has, according to ICER, the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. It has the largest adverse impact. is by far the costliest uh, to Alaska families. So we've already taken that step. Uh, what, what's next? I mean, if you don't want to cut um, and, and we're running out of savings or draws that we can make, fiscal reserves that we can use uh, to cover, where else are you going? Are you, are you now advocating – are you advocating – uh, taxes is the response that I have when when I get into those discussions, and the, and the problem, Michael, at both the federal level and the state level, is is it gets harder and harder the farther on you go. If you don't fix the fiscal fiscal deficit this year, th- this was the learning out of the the new learning sort of out of the CBO analysis. If you don't start fixing the budget deficit, uh, the federal budget deficit this year, uh, then the steps next year or the year after that and the year after that and the year after that get increasingly harder because you've got costs that are going up. Medicare is going up, Social Security, uh, and, you've, and interest expense uh, is going up. And so you've got, you've got more costs that you're going to have to, have to deal with if you don't start cutting uh, those programs back or discre- dis- uh, cut discretionary spending back. So it, we're, we're making it harder and harder and harder. It's hard enough to see the path to, to getting back to fiscal sustainability uh, at both the federal and state level where we are right now, but but once you if you if you don't address it now if you don't have a solid plan for addressing it now it gets uh, uh, exponentially harder the the farther down the road we go. Well, and I think that's one thing we keep hitting on. Of course, is this kicking the can down the road? I mean, not only and now this is better. This is a better reasoning as to why we shouldn't do that because it gets harder and harder and harder. But we saw the same group of people agree to that same fact. Remember the after the ICE report. Remember we were saying the sustainable level was four point one billion dollars. That was the sustainable level, and then a few months later, no, it's gonna actually now it's gonna be four point two, you know, or three point nine, and now it's gonna, you know, if we keep waiting, the sustainable number has to drop further and further and further. And they assured us that they were all all in at the four point one or four point two level of spending. And that they were going to do it, but when the rubber met the road again, they just decided to kick the can back down the road, and that is—it's horrible. They—they they, they did. I mean, they—they they reclassified things in order to claim that they that they met, you know, got near the four point one mark uh, at the time, but that was just drawing down reserves from uh, the DGF. They re, re, they used some DGF designated general funds uh, to cover UGF un, un, unrestricted general funds. Uh, expenditures and really started and, and really that's just another way of of going into the state's fiscal reserves uh, to cover to cover spending. They haven't we haven't reduced we haven't reduced the fundamental drivers uh, of of cost either at the federal level or at the state level. We're facing the same problem both places. At the federal level, it is uh, uh, the mandatory spending, uh, Social Security. Uh, is going up. Uh, we've got fewer people that the fewer workers right. uh, every year we go. More workers retiring that are coming on board. Um, so the cost of Social Security are going up. They're certainly going up per worker. Uh, the cost of Medicare are going up. The cost of the discretionary uh, spending is going up. Defense spending is going up. Non-discretionary or non-defense uh, discretionary spending is going up. Uh, all of those drivers are 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 pushing. Uh, spending farther and farther up, and we're not going in and addressing those at the federal level. The same thing is going on uh, at the state level. PERS and TERS uh, is uh, is going up. Uh, it's hard to deal with PERS and TERS. You just sort of have to accept. It's sort of like manda- Alaska Alaska's equivalent of mandatory federal spending. PERS and TERS is, is going up. It may go up even faster uh, because the PERS and TERS investment fund isn't earning the 8% return. Uh, that's projected for it. K through 12 spending uh, uh, is staying uh, relatively steady, uh, but we increased it uh, this year and, and sort of set a new base that people will be looking at uh, to increase it uh, uh, next year. Um, uh, you look at Medicaid expenditures, 
uh, in the states are going up at the federal level. They're going to be going up at the state level. Uh, Medicaid expansion adds to that, but they were going up anyway. So we've got, I mean, we've got fundamental cost drivers uh, that are going up, and it's all a question of of where where your spending level is relative to where your revenue level is going to be, uh, and our revenue level looking a little bit better with oil back up uh, in the 70s, uh, and looking a little better with with price stable or with production stabilization, but it's not going it, to unless we blow out price again, uh, uh, which is always a possibility, but you don't want to count on that unless we blow out price again. Revenues are going to stay relatively stable, and and we've seen. Uh, at the relatively stable revenue level, you don't cover expenses. So costs going up, revenue staying uh, relatively stable, that that's an increasing deficit at the state level. Right. We've got to get these under control. We've got right. to get these under control. And and every year we don't do it, it's just going to be worse and worse and worse. And this past legislature, uh, we'll talk about this more in a moment, but, the, but this past legislature made the problem even worse yet right. by, taking some co- by taking some costs that we were going to cover uh, in the next few years that this generation was going to cover and kicking those down the road, even adding more to the costs right. uh, that we're facing, uh, facing down the road. So it's, it's a situation that I think, as I said, I think it's the overriding uh, fiscal issue and, and to me the overriding issue period um, uh, in these campaigns, both at the state and federal level. What are you doing that's going to make our 2020 uh, and 2024 uh, uh, years better uh, well, what are you doing that's going to make our five-year and 10-year forecast better uh, than where we're going right now? Brad Keithley is our guest. He is the director and founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. He's a former oil and gas consultant and attorney, and uh, he comes in every week to talk about these issues. What are you going to do? That's the question that Brad is asking these candidates. And, of course, the first thing you'll hear every candidate say, well, not every candidate, but a lot of the candidates say, because they'll have it down pat, we're going to create jobs. We're going to create jobs in this economy. We're going to do it. Now, first of all, I have just a quick question. When did it become government's job to create jobs, you know, <laughs> to create jobs? Because quite honestly, government is a net consumer. Government is not a net producer. Government is a net consumer. It is the private it is the private markets. It is the free market and the entrepreneur's job to create uh, employment. It is not the government's job. And uh, unfortunately, that seems to be the case. Uh, and and in part, I think that makes sense. The problem is, is that there's a lot of people out there claiming that job creation is happening when uh, I, that may not necessarily be the case. Brad? Well, so we so we've had two recent examples of arguments about we need to do something in the state, we need to do something from a state uh, uh, legislative standpoint in order to create jobs. The first was Medicaid expansion. Now, Medicaid expansion in part was was about covering individuals who were not otherwise being covered. Uh, but frankly, a second part of that argument was creation of jobs. We brought additional federal funds into the state uh, and, and that generated jobs. And if you look at the healthcare sector of the Alaska job market, it's the only one that's 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 going up. Uh, and if you if you trace the the, the federal dollars coming in, uh, and and the bump that we get from additional Medicaid expansion dollars, the healthcare sector jobs are increasing as a result of of those uh, as a result of those funds being spent. But is that what government should be doing? Should government be, you know, doing things? To, to spend more money in the economy and create jobs in a in a in a given sector, uh, or should government be lo- being look out look out for the overall economy? We should. I mean, government should take into account jobs, but but you need to look out for the overall economy, not any given sector. Not say, oh, we need more jobs in the healthcare sector. Isn't that a good thing? Uh, and so go out and and spend. <coughs> excuse me. Agree to Medicaid expansion. To, to expand the, uh, the the jobs in the healthcare sector, you do need to be concerned about jobs. But if you're going to be concerned about jobs, the last thing you want to be doing is cutting the permanent fund dividend, because according to the ICER analysis, cutting the permanent fund dividend has the largest <laughs> adverse effect on the overall economy of of any of the fiscal steps you can take, any of the new revenue options you can take. And when you say oh and when we say overall economy, when ICER says overall economy, they mean two things. They mean income and jobs. 
Right. So cutting the PFD, and, and when you look at the ICER analysis, the biggest adverse effect of all of, of all of the various fiscal options on jobs was cutting the PFD. So when you say biggest advert, you don't want to you don't want to do things that cut jobs. Uh, cutting the PFD is the worst thing you can do. Now we've had a re- another run of 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 you know we need to be doing something for government for jobs. We had Medicaid expansion, uh, and and Democrats largely were big were in favor of that. Health se- the health sector was 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 big into that. You know supporting that to to create jobs, bring these additional funds in, spend additional state funds. Uh, that frankly we didn't have under our fiscal situation to create these additional jobs. Now in this last session we had the same jobs argument with another sector. It was with the oil sector, right. and and it was the it was the House Bill 331. We need to pass 331. We need to go out and borrow all this money. Borrow out, borrow 750 million dollars with interest. Essentially borrow a, a billion dollars. Give it to give it to the producers all at once, uh, and they'll go out and create jobs. Well, yeah, that's great. They'll go out and create jobs in that sector and and in affiliated sectors, just like Medicare expansion, uh, Medicaid expansion created jobs in the healthcare sector and affiliated sector. Yeah, they'll help that sector. But what are they doing? Let's go back and look what that's doing uh, to the state and to the overall economy. Well, Medicaid came out, essentially came out of the CBR. We spent money we didn't have coming through revenues. We had to go into the CBR. We had to borrow money out of the CBR to fund Medicaid. So we drew down savings, uh, drew down the fiscal surplus that we that we had and that we're supposed to pass on to future generations. Drew that down to create these jobs. Is that the? I mean, so we created jobs in the healthcare sector. Is that what um, uh, Alaska is supposed to be doing? The state doesn't get any benefit out of those jobs. There's no taxes, state taxes, on those jobs. So we created jobs. We drew down the the CBR. Uh, created those jobs, and and the future Alaskans are going to have to pay for it through having reduced a uh, reduced CBR, uh, and and that led to the reduced CBR led led to PFD cuts, and will lead to taxes uh, down the road because we don't have any other revenue sources to go to. We're doing the same thing with with HB 331. We're drawing down essentially future reserves by borrowing this money now, but shoving the cost of it back to the future generation, putting it on the backs. Of people in the in the 2020s that are going to have to pay for it, uh, pay for it then to create jobs currently in this one sector. So so now we bailed out Medicaid, or now we bailed out the health sector with Medicaid expansion. Now we're going to bail out the oil fields, uh, the oil sector, uh, with HB 331. Both of those shoving the costs, uh, one through a CBR withdrawal, the other through borrowing, shoving those costs uh, down into the next generation where they can afford it less, frankly. Uh, than this generation can, just so we can create uh, some current jobs. What's being left behind? What's being left behind is the overall Alaska economy, because we've, 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 we're funding these things in part through cutting the PFD so we have revenues uh, in this generation and next to, to, to cover these costs. So we're cutting over the overall Alaska economy, cutting overall jobs, just so we can bail out these particular sectors. I think that's bad government policy, to, as you said, to be using government to bail out specific uh, industry sectors, but it's especially bad when you're <laughs> passing those costs on to future onto the future generation that we've already lumped a bunch of costs on, that we've right. already lumped PERS and TERS on, that we are already going to have to pay for the increased costs that are come out of coming out of Medicaid. So we, we've we've made this generation better. We've generated more jobs for this generation. Yay us! Uh, we've, we've, we've proven that we are the most selfish generation. Yay us. We've got additional jobs for ourselves, but we don't have the guts to pay for them ourselves. We've moved that uh, into the next generation. I, just, I, I think that's horrible government policy. Well, and I think, again, what it looks at, I mean, what it looks like when it's all said and done is that it is all about the short term and that there is no long term thinking. And that has historically been the problem. With government in Alaska, specifically the legislative branch, uh, I mean, and the governor to the same extent, but I mean, the legislative branch has consistently failed to plan for the long term. It just seems like they are running from election cycle to election cycle. Who can I appease now? What program can I not cut to make sure that that constituency remains the same? 
And when the time comes, I will say all the right things during, and this is why we're talking about it during election season. I will say all the right things during election season. Of course, I want the sustainable budget. Of course, I can commit to that $4.1 billion spending limit. Of course, I could do this. Of course, I can do that. And then they forget the second that the, that the ballot box has been emptied. They forget, and then they said, instead, I'll do this. I'll kick it down the road. I'm not going to stand up for my obligations. You talked about the PERS and TERS debt. They have not hit, in the last 12 years, they have hit the ACR, the annual, uh, or ARC, the annual required contribution. That is the money that they have committed to supposedly paying down and keeping the unfunded liability at a minimum. They've only hit it like two or three times in 12 years. So they can't even keep their word to contractual commitments. How in the hell are we supposed to believe that these guys are going to pull us out of this nosedive? Yeah, it's, it's exactly right. And, and the test for this, the test is not so much the words, but for incumbents, the test is what have you done? So those who voted, those who voted for Medicaid expansion created jobs, created uh, the additional coverage that Medicaid expansion did, but, did, but funded it out of the CPR, CBR, didn't have the guts to fund it out of, out of, out of you know making Alaskans pay for what they're voting for. Told them that that it was painless. That you know the feds would fund most of this. And we didn't need to worry about it. Um, and and now HB three thirty one, the same thing uh, on the Republican side. I mean, it's just the, it, the, the Medicaid expansion and HB three thirty one are the same thing. They're the same thing of taking money. Uh, out of the future generations, out of future Alaskans' pockets, to pay for good things now, to pay for you know flashy things now, to pay pay for Medicaid expansion now, and to pay for uh, 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 additional uh, the, the the hope of additional oil field uh, jobs now. It's a, it's the same thing. It's just it, it appeals to two separate special interests. Democrats like Medicaid expansion. They like you know, reinforcing the healthcare industry, Republicans like the oil industry. So they, right. so they voted for, for that special interest, HB 331. But if you look at the, if you, you know, sort of like a taste test, if you took off the label of, of what they were doing and just look at the fiscal consequences of what they were doing, didn't label it good for oil, didn't label it good for healthcare, uh, and just took off those labels and said this, this monetarily, this fiscally, is what you did. You went out and borrowed seven hundred million dollars to generate additional jobs in one sector of the industry, for, or of the overall economy. Forget what, which sector it is, but you went out and borrowed seven hundred million dollars uh, uh, in order to generate that in the overall, overall economy, and you kicked the can down to the road to the next generation when they when they are less able to afford it than even the current generation is. What do you th and, and then you look at Medicaid and look at the fiscal consequences of that. Take the labels off. Look at the two. Somebody, some a fiscal analyst who was looking at those two with the labels off would say same thing, same yep. thing. You made the current generation current generation better, but you did it at the expense of the future generation that, that's less likely to be able to afford this. What what you know what what they try to do is they put the labels back on and say oh. Well, it's good for the, you know, it's good to do it for the oil industry because we like oil industry jobs, and it's good to do it for the healthcare industry because we like healthcare industry jobs. But if you take those labels off, they are exactly the same, the same sort of fiscal consequence. And that's, and, and so you've got to judge these people, these these people that are running this this election cycle, the ones that voted for 331, and say, look, yeah, you're telling me you're going to be fiscally responsible. You, you're telling me you're worried about Alaskans five years and ten years down the road, but you just you just proved that you don't. You just proved that if somebody can slap a label on it that is your special interest, the special interest that you like, that you'll that you'll spend that money. You'll you'll go in the hole to to make that industry better, to generate more jobs in that sector of the industry at the expense of the at the overall economy. So we need people we need people who look at these things, you know, like a blind case test. Look at the fiscal consequences of what you're doing. Not is it appealing to your industry or my industry or my donor base or your donor base, but look at the fiscal consequences of what you're doing and tell me are you gonna are you gonna be better uh, at it? Uh, tell me how you're gonna be better at it five years down the road. And you know what's even more amazing about this, uh, Brad, is that on in in the issuance of three thirty one specifically, all of the politicians that I've spoken to on the program since that time 
have all basically admitted on the program that they are very much victims, and I'm using that in air quotes, victims of the thinking uh, on the best case scenario. They have all basically said, well, but we're going to save this money, and that would be the money that they would have paid under the statutory formula, and we're going to save that money. And I said, but you realize that all the analysis says that that's great, and if you followed the formula, you would eventually save money. It would take longer to pay out, but you would save the money uh, with and pay a little bit of interest. But you realize that in the history of this legislature, we've never saved any money that we couldn't want to spend. I mean, you know, you, and they all have admitted that, yes, I said, you, you're saying that you don't expect them to spend that money. In the time of fiscal crisis that we are now, that they're not going to take those savings and apply them to other programs. And they're like, well, no, I, we, that would all happen. They all agree that that would happen. They literally have gotten sold on the idea of the best case scenario while realizing in their hearts of hearts that the worst case scenario is the most likely outcome, that this money will be spent and it will cost us a billion dollars more. But nobody bothered to strat that out for them and analyze that and show it to them. Or if they did, like you, if they did, they didn't bother to go read it and take a look at it. Yeah, it's it's you know, when I hear those defenses, in all honesty, what that triggers in me is the same thing I heard, frankly, with aces. Uh, I remember I'll never forget Lisa McGuire's statement when it, when when we realized uh, 2010, 2011, 2012, we weren't getting investment into the state and that ACES was the cause of that. Uh, she said, well, you know, the best thinking in the building down in Juneau at the time that we were putting that together was that this would work and it was a it was a good thing to do. The sort of the building mentality the, 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 it also reminds me of SB 91. You know, it it it, it would work. Right. Everybody in the building thought SB ninety one was the best thing to do. That it was that it was going to work, uh, and it, and it was going to go forward. But it's just, I mean, they get these, they get in these group think situations down in the building, down in Juno. They don't break out of it. They don't. You, you, you don't get contrary opinions in in the hearings. You get the witness list is whoever's supporting what the preconceived notion is, what the predetermined notion is. Uh, result is that you want to that you want to go down the road you want to go down. So they get witnesses that sort of reinforce the group thing. Right. Um, you get the lob lobbyists around them who are saying, "Yeah, boy, yeah, man, go out and borrow a billion dollars and yeah. you know give it to <laughs> give it." Give it, give it to my guy. So you're getting all that reinforcement, and 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 then you sort of have to wake up to the fact that oh my God, what did I do? Did that with Aces? Did that with with SB 91? And I swear, I swear, we're going to hit that with HB 331 too. When those, when the when the when the uh, 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 Alaskans in 2020, uh, in the 2020s, have to start paying the bill that this generation kicked down the road, they're going to start saying, what the hell were these guys thinking? Just like we're saying about PERS and TERS, what the hell were those guys in 2014 uh, thinking by piling these costs on us? Heck, they had high oil prices in 2014. Couldn't they pay? Couldn't they pay a, a bigger portion of it? Of it then? It's just the the mentality is kick it down the road. It'll be somebody else's problem. I won't have to worry about it, and I'll look like a hero. But with Aces, with SB 91, and with HB 331. Uh, we're, that that philosophy with Medicaid expansion, that philosophy is just running the next generation right up against a wall. And and I, I I'm sorry, I'm sorry that people voted for it, uh, and I'm sorry that they had this group think, but it was the wrong fiscal thing to do. I, I'm, I mean, maybe maybe we have, ought to have a rule that you take the labels off. It's not it, you you can't identify the special interest that gets the benefit uh, of of a foolish fiscal policy. You just have to look at the fiscal dynamics. Uh, of what you're doing and uh, and and vote on that, but it's I mean it's 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 a bad deal, uh, a bad situation. The people who voted for it, I think, um, yeah, they may be they may be having second thoughts and they may be you know realizing they got into groupthink, but how can you trust them? You know, when they when they say, well, you know, we got it now, we got it, we're not going to do this again. How can you trust them when they when they were so gullible with respect to something uh, that just happened last session? I think you have just hit on the key, Brad, uh, because my question has been, how can you send the same group of people back to Juno again and again and again and expect different results? These are the same people that had the la they lacked the foresight to see the outcome of their actions. 
They were unable to analyze the unintended consequences of the various bills and the spending that they had been doing. This is the same group that brought us to this position. And now you, again, they're, now they're saying, oh, don't worry, we'll, we'll dig us out of the hole. Hey, you've got a shovel in each hand, baby, and you're still digging. I don't think you're the right cat to send back. I really don't. And that is kind of where we're at. Yeah, they they learned they learned the the words. We had a you and I had a discussion a couple of weeks ago about uh, about the George Orwell's 1984 and why that was applicable to the Alaska uh, right. uh, fiscal situation, to the Alaska political situation. They learned the words. They learned sustainable budget, uh, and they <laughs> and and they learned the words. You know, uh, uh, no new taxes and all that sort of stuff. And they and they say those words, and they think. I honestly think they think they're solving the problem, and I honestly think they think they're moving toward a solution. But but the sustainable budget they're moving toward is not the sustainable budget that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that was talked about in the in the late 2010s in the in the in the in the in the run up to the 2012 election, where sustainable budget became something of a of a of a phrase. It's not. Uh, the the notion that was originally developed they've changed the notion sustainable budget is oh yeah our friends keep getting you know keep getting money um, and, and and taxes I mean taxes is another thing no new taxes hey guys we've got taxes you just passed PFD cuts uh, a fifty percent tax on the PFD that has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy is by far the costliest to uh, to Alaskans yeah you don't call it a tax. But that's exactly what it is, and so they talk about you know they talk about HB 331 as as being a good thing because you know it'll incre- it'll, it will increase jobs. Well, yeah, it sort of results in increased jobs in the current in the current cycle. But what have we done to the 2020s? What have we done to future Alaskans who are going to be in a worse situation that we're putting in a worse situation than even this generation is? We're taking jobs out of that economy because we're going to have to either continue PFD cuts or cut PFDs deeper or tax uh, in that situation or cut uh, go- other government spending programs that, that frankly uh, do good things. So you're, you're putting us in a situation by, by claiming to you know, being good, by creating jobs now, you're putting us in a situation in which we're worse uh, in the mid-2020s instead of standing up uh, to those situations now. It's, it, y- y- they think they're doing the right thing. They think they've got it. They, they, they mouth those words, but they don't understand the fiscal consequences of, of the steps they're taking. As you can tell, Brad Keithley and I can get really wound up over this because it's a little frustrating. It's frustrating to be the town crier who's been shouting about these issues for years, and yet nobody listens. And yet we watch it get worse as they make the decisions that we counsel against. I mean, maybe maybe we should just rule the world, Brad. Maybe that should be the answer, and, and we could fix all that. Um, let me go through a couple of the comments here, Brad, in the comment section before we come on to our final three or the final uh, item of our three items today. Um, it uh, I'm just reading some of the uh, some of the uh, comments in the chat room. Um, uh, Harold says, need to file a lawsuit to remove the state's access to the royalties and give them to the people and have the state, uh, I, and essentially then I think have the state tax the people, have the state set their spending on what the population agrees is viable state spending through taxation. Um, uh, Karen says, politicians have one goal. Lynn says, I voted against the Medicaid expansion. Uh, Karen says, Dems versus GOP, no difference. I think that's an important distinction because – there really isn't. I mean, right now, we're hearing all the whining and crying about the bipartisan coalition in the House, how the Dems have got control of the world. But the bottom line is the Republicans f- had their hands firmly on the tiller when they crashed this ship into the reef. I mean, it was a governor, Republican governor, Republican Senate majority, Republican House majority, uh, or some coalition con- controlled by the Republicans. I mean, this is, you know, stop pointing the fingers and realize that there's a problem on both sides, Brad. Well, exactly right, Michael. And 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 the problem on both sides, we just went through one of the problems on both sides. It, it is, it, it, there, it, it's like a, a, a dog whistle. Uh, when when certain industries are 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 mentioned, Medicaid expansion, healthcare, 
uh, expanding access for for Alaskans to health care, putting more jobs in the health care industry. That's a dog whistle for Republicans, right? Or for Democrats, rather. Uh, and they'll and they'll vote for that dog whistle for Republicans is oil industry, more oil jobs, better, uh, uh, a stronger uh, oil industry. And the Republicans respond to that. Again, if you take off the labels of what they were doing, the fiscal consequences, kicking the cost down the road uh, to, to the future generation, um, uh, that the, the fiscal consequences were exactly the same, but but it was both Democrats and this last legislature proved that Republicans are just as bad when when they get their dog whistle sounded when it's their industry, uh, they'll they'll run to that uh, run to that industry and uh, and and do what uh, do what the what what the lobbyists are, are advocating uh, them to do. It's just it, it was it was no different. We need people who put fiscal policy fiscal analysis. Fiscal responsibility first, um, not not any given industry over that, but right. Alaskan fiscal responsibility first, uh, and uh, and 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 go down that road. And that's frankly, there are some Democrats who are fiscally responsible. There are some Republicans who are fiscally responsible. But there's also Democrats who are fiscally non-responsible, and there are Republicans. That are fiscally unresponsible, and we need to call it both ways uh, because this last legislature demonstrated that give the Republicans back control. They had they had that vote in the House on 331. It's the Republicans that carried it. Give them back control, and by God, they'll respond to their dog whistle as fast as as fast as the Democrats will. Future consequences, future fiscal consequences, uh, be damned. All right. Uh, so that was just a couple of the comments. Oh, my favorite one so far is Karen, who says, Alice. But I don't want to go among mad people. The Cheshire Cat. Oh, you can't help that. We're all mad here. That is the, definitely a de- that's a, that's a that's a picture of Juno right there. If nothing else. All right, let's uh, let's take a crack at uh, number three today, which is kind of more of the macro view, uh, because now we're going to talk about some national things. You and I have had some discussions on national debt already this morning. In the past, we've had whole shows dedicated to what's going on. Um, well, things things could potentially get worse come October. Uh, there's not a whole lot on the ground about this, but uh, tell us what your top th- your third of the top three is. Well, there's, there's rumors now. Uh, President Trump uh, mentioned in a speech last week, I think it was, that, uh, that he's looking for another tax cut, uh, federal tax cut, in October. Uh, and, you know, the, the visceral reaction of most people is, yay, another tax cut. Uh, but the problem is, uh, it, it, it's focused on it wants to tax. What, what he was talking about was a cut in the corporate tax rate, another right. cut in the corporate tax rate, essentially to get to where he wanted to be in the first tax cut. He had to compromise. They had to compromise uh, in the rate, the corporate tax rate that came out of that to get enough votes. Uh, basically, what he's saying is he wants another tax cut that gets down to the initial the corporate rate that he uh, initially was talking about. The problem the problem is that that we haven't demonstrated at all. Since uh, since the initial since that December 2017 ta- or 2018 2017 tax cut, we haven't demonstrated at all that we're going to cut costs, cut spending. In fact, in January and then in March, uh, we passed uh, budget bills that increased uh, spending over what the projections had been. So the the deficit got widened from two perspectives. One, revenues got pulled down because of the tax cut. Spending got pulled up uh, because of the spending bills. Uh, and have, as we talked about earlier, increase the deficit national def, or national def, annual deficit to over a billion dollars. Another tax cut sounds fine. Yes, we're we're all for lower taxes, but until we get spending down, until we actually do that, not talk about it, not get out on the campaign campaign trail and say that's what we need to do, until we actually cut spending, we can't afford. We can't afford the tax cut we had. It's increased the deficit. We can't afford another tax cut. So any dis- discussion of, of an additional tax cut has to be coupled with uh, uh, spending cuts and doing spending cuts. Unlike, unlike the last time where we took our dessert of tax cuts and then said we'll get to the vegetables uh, after we do that, and then it proved when we got to the vegetables that we just, you know, we spent, we we, we did dessert, the second course of dessert by spending more. Uh, instead of getting dessert again, another tax cut again, we have to prove 
that, that we're going to eat our vegetables. We have to prove that we're going to get spending down to long-term sustainable levels before we can afford another tax cut. I know. I know people don't want to hear that. I know they, they just want to respond to the dog whistle of tax cuts and say, yes, we're for tax cuts. Tax cuts, good. Uh, and anybody who opposes tax cuts, bad. Well, guys, you got to pay for it somehow. And, right. and, if you, and if this generation doesn't pay for it, the next generation is going to be stuck with the tab in terms of increased interest costs. So I think personally, and, and if this matures and if more people start talking about tax cuts, I'm going to, I'm going to keep saying we've got to – do spending cuts first. Earn your tax cut. Earn the fact that you can have another tax cut. Demonstrate that we're getting spending down uh, before we hit. Uh, before we talk seriously about having another tax cut. Well, and again, this is exactly the same problem we're having in the state of Alaska. Nobody is willing to tell the hard truth. I mean, we are here on this program willing to tell the hard truth, but no politician is willing to say, to his constituency, to the face of his constituency, I'm sorry, Don and Martha, we can't do program X, Y, or Z anymore. We can't do these things because we just don't have the money. And even if we borrow the money now, somebody's got to pay it back in the future. And so we've got to stop. We can't do all, we can't be all things to all people. And no politician is willing to do that. Not any Republican, not any Democrat. They may be willing to do it in some of the committees. And, I mean, I, I say that there's a handful who have taken a stand. Uh, I think Shelley Hughes has taken a stand. She jumped out of the caucus. Mike Schauer, uh, Mike Dunleavy. But for the most part, they, they vote in lockstep when it comes time to, the, uh, you know, to hit the budget with the, with the coalition, the binding coalition and all that stuff. And so are the binding caucus. So, I mean, nobody is willing to say, I'm only going to be here for one cycle. Because you're not going to like me by the time it's over. Because by the time it's over, you're going to realize, maybe in the long run, you'll realize I'm right. But right now, I'm telling you, we don't have any more money. We've got to cut spending. And uh, and somebody's not going to be happy. But that's just the way it is. Yeah. And, and you know, what that really means, Michael, is it's incumbent upon you on this show. It's incumbent upon me when I write about stuff to ask those questions, to say, to call those people out, to say, these are the issues that they're dodging on and, and at least try to get voters to focus on or educate voters to understand that these are the consequences of the decisions we're making. Yes, we might have more jobs right now. Yes, this generation might feel a little bit better because we got Medicaid. But what are we doing? What are we doing to the next generation and, and generations that follow that? What's the fiscal mess we're leaving? And if you look at if you look at the at the trajectory, it's just I mean as, as I said on an earlier show, this generation is going to go down as the as the most selfish of all the generations because we just took all the benefits now and we passed the and we and we put it all on a credit card and then we said, hey, that next generation, my kids are going to pay are going to pay the bill on that credit card and we're going to leave them with the standard of living that is much less right. uh, than than we have now and frankly less than what our parents left us. We're not we're not improving the situation. We're 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 devolving the situation. And and maybe you know people, grandparents who who are concerned about their kids and grandkids, millennials who are concerned about what's going to happen to them, um, uh, maybe they start hearing about it. So yes, candidates are going to say what candidates are going to say. They're all going to say, "Hey, I'm going to bring you dessert. I'm going to bring you dessert after dessert after dessert. I'm going to put the economy on a sugar high. We're all going to live happily for the next <laughs> three years, and then we're just going to have a sugar high crash." Um, we're yes, all going to have gonna that. We're all going to have the diabetes by the time this is over. Yeah. The diabetes of spending. That's what's going to happen. Um, yeah. Her Harold, Harold offers a solution, and I want to get your take on this before we do our final PS here. Uh, Harold says, here are your solutions. Number one, reform the spending formulas. And I agree because Lynn, and Lynn says later spending formulas do, in fact, di di dictate a large part of the operating budget. And I agree. I think you have to crack every one of those formulas open. No more automatic escalators. No more automatic steps. No more anything. Everything should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. And, yes, that may draw out the process, but that's okay. It also offers transparency and allows you to change things when the, when the chips are down, so to speak. So that's number one, re reform the spending formulas. Harold says, number two, set the royalty rates at a single 18% level. No more indicators, escalators, sliders, and uppers. No more tax credits. No more this and that and the other thing. Set it and forget it. Watch the state economy's boom is what he says. What says Brad Keithley? Well, I agree on the spending formulas. The spending formulas have to be 
uh, have to be uh, gone into. I mean, it's like it's the it's the state equivalent of of the mandatory spending that we see driving the federal budget. Two thirds of the federal budget is mandatory spending set by Social Security uh, and Medicare and and Medicaid in large part, uh, and it's on autopilot. And then we're not doing anything about it. It's growing at a at a rate faster, much faster than inflation, uh, and it's the it's the it's it's the iceberg that's sitting out there that's going to sink this ship uh, uh, because we're just not we're not looking at it. It's just setting off there on autopilot. The equivalent at the state level are all these formulas. And yes, we need to go into these formulas. We need to go into the mandatory spending programs at the federal level, and we need to go into the equivalent at the state level. The uh, the spending formulas. Absolutely agree with that. The royalty rate is is much much more difficult than than just a simple set it at eighteen percent. The royalties are contracts. Uh, the royalty rates are contracts. We've we've contracted with the oil and gas producers, um, and and we would not withstand a constitutional challenge of just arbitrarily trying to reset those at a higher level. So a lot of uh, all of the all of the uh, 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 leases that are out there now, uh, which covers a large part of the North Slope, co- covers a large part of the productive area. Uh, the royalty rates have been set by. Uh, have been set by uh, uh, contract, have been set in the leases. The way you adjust those, frankly, is through production taxes. Um, and we'll talk in, in in a future program about production taxes and whether we ought to be looking at those. And frankly, I think there's a case for why we ought to be looking at production taxes. But the way you do the adjustments in those are production taxes, and, and that's the way that, that we get at that second issue that uh, that Harold's talking about. I uh, I have one final question because, and this is kind of a lot for the folks in the interior. Um, there was a very uh, interesting exchange that took place uh, in kind of a, a Publius kind of uh, discussion where John Coghill and Dermot Cole, John Coghill, of course, a senator from the interior, Dermot Cole, one of the editorial staff there at uh, the Fairbanks Daily News Miner, were sniping back and forth at each other in various articles talking about um, tax rates and oils and, and spending. And Dermot Cole had a piece where he basically tries to go back and put this to rest with John Coghill, saying that John Coghill has missed the mark on SB 21 and said uh, and says that, uh, you know, basically Dermot Cole is saying that SB 21 is a failure for the state. Uh, that throughput numbers have not increased has been argued. Uh, and he lays out a bunch of stats and figures on this, talking about uh, Coghill massaging the numbers. Um, and I think this is interesting because, again, neither one of them are my favorite people, and I love to watch them snipe at each other. But go ahead and, and tell us what your thoughts are. I, I sent you the article earlier, and you, you yep. uh, have some thoughts on it. Well, they're both wrong. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the the quick and dirty on it is they're both wrong. SB 21 – uh, was was a debate about this. We were having we were in a six to seven percent decline rate uh, uh, and on 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 production from the slope. Uh, and uh, if you looked at the levels of investment that were coming into the state relative to levels of investment that were going elsewhere in the world, the state wasn't getting its historic share. Uh, we were sort of Alaska was sort of last on the on the investment list, and that explained the decline rate because if you don't reinvest. Uh, in in fields and develop new fields, then you're going to have a significant decline rate. SB 21 was really about how do we get that decline rate changed. Dermot's trying to frame trying to frame the argument as whether we were going to increase production uh, above then current levels. Uh, but that wasn't really that that the, whether we could increase production above then current levels was a secondary argument. The real argument was whether we could change the the direction of, of that decline curve, and instead of having a six to seven percent decline curve, get it to a four to a three to a two to a one. At the time, and uh, I argued uh, in the debates about 2014 or in 2014 about SB uh, 21, I argued that we we should declare success if we got the decline rate from uh, from the six and seven percent we were on to two percent decline rate, still having declined, but at getting the level of investment that reduced uh, the decline rate. Uh, uh, we have we have overachieved relative to that because we've kept production relatively flat. That's Dermot's that's Dermot's argument that we're down a little bit but we're relatively flat. John, I think, overreaches. I'm not sure what John's doing, but John's John's trying to prove somehow that production has gone up. Um, and prove that that is that is you know the result of SB 21, and John is manipulating figure, figure, figures to do that, but he doesn't need to do that. I mean, the debate is 
were we going to continue a 6% decline wor- uh, curve or were, were we going to get it up to a, uh, a three, reduce it to a three to two to a 1% decline curve? I, I think holding steady, which both, you know, Dermot admits and, and John, if you, if you redo his numbers, logically uh, proves out, I think holding it flat is a, is a huge success. Uh, from from the direction we were otherwise headed, so it's a it's a cute debate between Dermot and John, but I think they're both missing the point. John trying to prove there's an increase uh, is the is the wrong point. Dermot trying to prove that John's wrong that there wasn't an increase, but in the in the in the process admitting that we've held it flat, uh, I think proves that SB 21 has been a been a success as opposed to the to the failure that uh, that Dermot argues it is. William says. This is why Alaska needs its own oil company like Norway. And all I could think of is handing the keys of the car over to your 13-year-old. Um, I mean, really. I mean, I, you know, because, I mean, show me, William, how the state has done well with almost anything we're talking about from that first $900 million royalty payment on to today. Tell me how that's worked out for us nine times out of ten. I can't imagine that that would make for good, uh, make for good fiscal sense in the long run. I have argued for that in the past, Michael. You, you, it's before we started talking on here, so you, you won't know that. But I've argued for Alaska having its own investment vehicle, not, not its own operating oil company, but its own investment vehicle like, uh, like Norway has. The, 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 the point of, of it, though, is you have – in Norway, you have professionals running it. It's separated from the political process. It's not subject to the same sort of legislative constraints Wins. that, that – yeah. That we're, that we're used to here, it's run essentially in Norway by the equivalent of the permanent fund uh, that we have over here, uh, by the permanent the professionalism of the permanent fund corporation. And I think there are advantages to the state being a co-investor uh, with the oil with the oil industry in uh, in, in developments. I, we can talk about that at length in another program. Uh, but but when when that argument is made. It is made in the context, and the person, and the entity that controls that, is a professional, non-political, non-attackable, uh, 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 extremely professionally organized operation like the Permanent Fund Corporation. So, yeah, there, there is, a, there is a case for that, but it's not. You can't have it like the AGDC, where the you know a new governor comes in, he dumps out the entire board, right, uh, and, and you know, or cuts all the funding to it or whatever, and just basically yeah. cuts it off at the knees, right. Yeah, it, it needs to be it needs a, to be a permanent fund corporation. In fact, at the time we were having this debate, uh, and I was advocating that I was advocating it, putting it in the permanent fund corporation because it's it's another investment. It should be viewed as another investment uh, option by the state uh, uh, to be to be evaluated whether to put state money in these things or not. So uh, there's an argument for it, but but in the current light, what we've seen with AGDC and other things, it's not there, there's not there's not a good good argument for it right now we sort of need to get back on sound financial footing get our spending down get our revenues stabilized uh, and then maybe we can have that discussion again now it's not the right time to have that discussion brad keith lee is the director and founder of alaskans for sustainable budget a former oil and gas consultant and attorney brad i want to give you a chance just to summate and wrap up here as we walk out the door with you i may, I may be out of the air michael i'm not sure <laughs> i i let, let, let me go back to one one more time with the beginning. The overall right overriding issue that I see in this election is how candidates are looking at how they're going to get us not only out of the current fiscal crisis, not only get us jobs currently, but taking a long term perspective and and their vision for where we are in five and ten years and how we get there in five and ten years, how we get right. to fiscal stability, recognizing the reality of things like the increased PERS and TERS costs, recognizing the reality of increased Medicaid costs, recognizing the budget formulas that we've got per- currently in place. What are you going to change? What are you going to change to get us on a sound fiscal footing so that we're not continuing to pass these costs on to, to the next generation five and ten years uh, down the road? And that, and that, to me, is the overriding uh, issue it touches on HB 331 touches on the PFD touches on a lot of other issues but the overriding issue is how are you getting us to a much better place in five years and ten years these are the questions that have to be asked of our uh, you know wannabe elected officials or incumbents that are going back 
I mean, quite honestly, I'm ready to vote pretty much no on almost everybody going back. So, I mean, it, it's so frustrating, Brad. You and I, again, have been beating this drum for years in our own separate ways and then together for the last four years. And I just I, I just can't see why we're continuing down this road. But maybe, you know, maybe we'll just we'll have to figure something out here. Brad Keithley. Thank you so much for coming on board and joining us today. We appreciate you being part of the program. Uh, have, a ha have a happy 4th of July, and we will see you next week here on the Big Radio Program, okay? M Michael, thanks as always for having me. I, I look forward to it. All right, appreciate you coming in. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.